are that um, that men's hair is to be cut above their ears. So I would be thrown out now. Um, they uh, some are against uh, short sleeve shirts. So Michael, sorry, you're out. Okay. Um, and Jason, yeah, Gary, see, you're all, oh, okay, except us, all right. I try to blend in and get along with everybody, so I roll my sleeves up. You don't know what I am, okay? But here's the thing. They have so many of these silly rules. And you can do everything on the outward, and like everybody see how you are. But what about your thoughts? What about the things that you focus on in your thinking? What about the time you spend online? What about all of these things that people do, but outwardly they appear to be wonderful? That's how the Pharisees were. And so he says, guys, you've got to have a righteousness that exceeds that. And what righteousness is that? It's the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? And the Bible tells us, over in Matthew 6, verse 33, seek ye first, what? The kingdom of God and what? And his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. You see, we're to seek the righteousness of God. And that righteousness that we're seeking is the Lord Jesus Christ, is it not? It is the Christ life. And we're seeking to live by what he says in his word. We're seeking to obey him in all things. And not as a miserable kind of life but a joyous life. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, there's great joy in your life. Even though you might be as poor as a rock, I mean, uh, you're, 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 you're joyful. Why? Because you have something that the world doesn't have. You have a peace that they don't have. You have a hope that they don't have. I mean, people are still scared to death about what's going to happen, they don't know. And I'm not saying don't be cautious, but I'm saying don't be fearful. That would be against the word of God, wouldn't it? He says, we're not to have a spirit of fear. God hasn't given us that spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. So we have this wonderful uh, joy and peace and comfort within us. And that exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees because their righteousness was based upon what they did. But you got to know that within them, they knew the difference between right and wrong. Do you honestly think, I mean, one of the things that they would do is they would say, um, you know, somebody would come to them and say, I need some money. Can you donate some money here? Oh, I've got, all I have is this pile of gold over here, but it's Corban. It's dedicated to the temple. So I can't, it would, I, I could give it to you and help you. I'm sure that would help you out. But because I've dedicated it to God, I've dedicated it to the temple, I can't give it to you. That's the law. But you know what they would do? They had a loophole that would make them the receivers of the gold for the temple, and they would use it however they wished. Isn't that amazing? You don't think that they didn't know they were doing wrong? Of course they did. But if you're in the, in the frame of mind that says, hey, I can go and do whatever I want and just act like I'm being faithful to God, uh, nobody will ever know. Well, but you're going to meet God one day. And he knows. You see, I, I will just tell you this. I grew up in a pastor's home. I know how incredibly easy it is to fool Christians. You just have to say things a certain way and you have to say the right words and you have to have a smile and you have to say hallelujah at the right time and you just go do what you want to do. That doesn't fool anybody. Certainly not God. But this was the righteousness Jesus is referring to here. Then he moves on to verse 21. And he said, you have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. So this was the, this was the, uh, the sixth commandment, wasn't it? Thou shalt not kill. Now, 
And if you killed somebody, what was the penalty for killing somebody? Murder, a death, right? You received the death penalty. So he is saying, you've heard that it was said by them of old time. Now, who is this them of old time? Well, certainly, I mean, I was reading one commentator who basically said, well, no doubt Jesus is referring to some of the older rabbis who are referring to something. Maybe, but I would think that by them of old time has to do with what? The time of Moses, the time when the law was given. You have heard it said, this is the law. The law has been given. Now, is the law important today? Yes, it's very important. Okay, and, and, and Christians many times think, well, I, because I'm saved, I'm saved by the blood of Christ, I don't have to worry about the law. Well, you don't worry about the law in the sense that you're going to go to hell because of not keeping the law. Although the Bible does say no murderer has any part in the kingdom of heaven. So here's the thing. You, we, we are to keep the law. Why? Because not because it will keep us saved, but because we are saved. This is, this is the, the Christian life. This is how we're to live our lives. By obeying the law of God joyfully. So he is saying, Thou shalt not kill, whosoever shall kill, but shall be in danger of the judgment. And then, and a matter of fact, Galatians 5.20 calls, calls murder, or uh, this, uh, what he's talking about here, as a work of the flesh. And they who, who do the works of the flesh shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. So he is saying something very important here, but he, then he goes on in verse 22. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Now, we'll stop there for a moment because is there a difference between being angry at someone and killing them? Well, of course there is. Okay, I can be angry at somebody but I certainly have not killed them. And I can't be arrested for being angry at somebody. But if I killed them, then there's another whole other thing involved there. So he's not saying it's wrong to be angry because Jesus was angry at times. And he tells us, be angry and sin not. So there is a way to be angry and not sin. There is a righteous anger. But here he is talking about the fact that you're angry without a cause with, or for just anything. Like, you know, they bumped into you at the grocery store. Uh, they, uh, you know, they backed out when you were trying to back out and you almost got in an accident. So you're mad at them and you're yelling at them. This, this whole thing, this kind of anger that just comes out of us because of our contempt for people and the fact that we think our rights are more important than theirs are. This is the fact where, where this anger can lead to murder. It can lead to killing. And you've seen that in our society, haven't you? People just get killed for no reason at all. They start out their day, they're going to go do, run their errands, and before the end of the day, they're dead. Because somewhere along the line, they offended somebody. And that somebody decided they were going to carry it farther than just, you know, when the person says, I'm sorry. No, they didn't want to hear a sorry. They, they wanted to, to be exalted above everything. So here's the thing, is that this kind of anger can lead to this if we're not careful, right? Now, let me explain a little bit further, because he, he knows that people will say, well, yeah, I don't know if that's really the case. So he tells us what this kind of anger is. Notice what he says. Whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. Well, when's the last time you said Raka to somebody? Oh, none of us have done that, so we're safe. But what does it mean? What does raka mean? Well, it has to do with the fact that it's a word of, of great contempt for somebody. You, 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 you despise their, who they are as a human being. You basically, you have uh, put them in the place of being an idiot. Now, we live in a society today that, uh, I was telling somebody earlier about this, is that, 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 the way that we live in our country now is that we are very rude and we're very crude and we're pushed to the edge all the time. Have you noticed that? 
I was saying to my daughter earlier, I said, you know, uh, I don't want to get into all the story, but well, might as well. I had found this little teacup, uh, two teacups and saucers in a cabinet that we forgot about. And since we have nothing else to do, we're pulling out stuff. My wife would say, what's up there? Well, it's better you don't know. And so we found these and wonderful little teacups made, made in Russia, this Russian China. And um, uh, so naturally, I had to wash them and we had to have tea with them. And so, you know, I, I said, I said, you know, it'd be great. What we should do is we should teach our granddaughters how to have a tea party. A real tea party. Well, they didn't like that at all. You know, they, we don't want to drink tea. But here's the thing is that I, we've lost this kind of what they call, used to call genteelness. That we have, we're not polite. We are not, uh, uh, you know, respecting of anyone. Uh, our young people are very disrespectful. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you are old or not. If they, you know, if, if you're in their way, you're going to be knocked down. Well, not everybody's like that, and we're glad of that. But I want to point out to you, there seems to be less and less of an interest in the welfare of anybody else, except during times like this. Isn't that amazing? People become more friendly until after we've gone two months or so, and then we're like, just get out of my way. Why are you in the store at all? But here's the thing. We cannot have this contempt for people that basically is, 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 is saying you are worthless. You have no worth at all. And when we talk like that to people, Jesus said, that's this being angry without a cause, isn't it? That's this undercurrent of anger that is there. And then he says, you'll be in danger of the council, and then whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Well, fool is a word that people think is funny to call somebody. Who was the, uh, the guy who used to be Mr. T, you would say, you know, you know fool. You, you know, um, and boys would call people fools, you know, and, and uh, not really understanding what that means. To be a fool does not necessarily mean you're stupid. It doesn't mean that you are, have, have nothing upstairs. But it really is a, is a name of judgment here. It is a name that basically is calling a person a child of hell. And go to hell, basically, is what you're saying. You call someone a fool, that's, what, that's how God... That's not, you say, well, I don't think of it like that. Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice that we come up with every time somebody brings up something about the scripture and says, hey, I don't think we should be doing this. I don't think we should be living our lives like this. You'll always have the crowd that says, but I don't think of it like that. Well, my, my. Aren't we fortunate to have you, the interpreter of scripture, with us? It's not about what we think about it. The scripture is never about what we think. It's about what God says it is. So whether you think calling someone a fool means you're calling them a child of hell or you're consigning them to hell, doesn't really matter. God thinks that, that way. And he's the one we have to deal with. You see, it's always important that we, that we consider what God says about this. Now, again, this all leads to what? This anger. Without a cause, without a just cause, without a real cause. And it can't just be something that you don't like. A cause has to do with, this is a moral issue. This is a spiritual kind of thing. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm angry at the world. I'm angry at the way that people live their lives. I'm angry at how they, how they mock God and they disrespect the things of God. I'm angry about that. That's a cause. Remember when David was going to go and fight Goliath and his brothers began to mock him and make fun of him and say, well, you just want to make a name for yourself. And, uh, and he basically said to them, why are, you, why are you saying this to me? Isn't there not a cause? 
Isn't there a just cause? And if you look at that and you'll see that when David goes down to fight Goliath, David does not give these idle threats like Goliath is doing. I'll, I'll do this to you. I will give your flesh to the ravens. I'll do this and this. David's emphasis, if you'll reread that sometime, is on the fact that Goliath has disrespected the God of Israel. And he is there to offend or to avenge God's honor. You say, well, I don't think we have to avenge God's honor. Yeah, but it got David in the book, didn't it? God used him in a spectacular way. So we have to have this cause about us. And what is our cause, really, as Christians? To glorify God, to proclaim the gospel to make sure God's people know the Word of God so they can live according to the Word of God. It's so important that we, that we understand this. This is how we're to live our lives. You should not have... Let me see if I can say it this way. You can be someone else's enemy, but they should never be your enemy. Do you see that? They can despise you, but you don't have that same right. You have to pray for them. You have to pray for your enemies. You have to love your enemies. And a lot of times we fail in that, don't we? And we have to ask God to help us. Now in verse 23, notice what he says here. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar... And there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee. Leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Wow. What if that was practiced during the offering times? Would there be, ever be any money? But if you make your heart right, there'll be much more because you're giving out of a heart of abundance then rather than thinking of all the reasons, you, you know, why are they here and this and that. Listen, a, a church is a family of God, isn't it? We are to, we are to be a microcosm of the, of the uh, uh, church as a whole. That, and I hate to use that word universal, but, you know, international doesn't make sense either. But... This, this, this glorious church, the bride of Christ, each local assembly is to be a picture of that. And so we're to have this family relationship, aren't we? We're to love one another. And, and it doesn't mean that we have to agree with everyone. But when we say things like that, because I, I hear that many times, well, we don't have to agree together. But we should seek agreement. Okay? Not just have this tolerance that says, okay, well, they believe this and I believe that. And as long as we don't sit next to each other, we're okay. No, we, we've got to come to agreement somehow. You know, if you believe something entirely different, then there has to be a reason why you believe that. And you should have to defend it with scripture, not just I have a feeling about that. Okay, so this is why it's so important when we have Bible studies and we come together and we tend to spend time afterwards asking questions and seeking more knowledge about it. Why? Because it helps us so that we can, we can maintain these, these, these relationships where we, we are reconciled to one another. So he says, if you have a gift and you bring it, but you remember that you have something against your brother, not that necessarily he has something against you. You have something against them, them. Then you go to them and you make it right. And you do not come back with your gift until you have made it right. However long that takes. But you better hurry because we have an electric bill to pay. I'm just saying we need to make things right because God is glorified with our offerings then. Because I, I, has, I always hesitate to say this, but let me just say it to you. Because I think you're mature. You're, you're mature enough to handle this. God doesn't really need your money. I mean, think about this. How much do you think it would cost 
to make the moon. I mean, how much do you think it would cost? I mean, where would you start to get the materials? I mean, we're talking trillions and whatever comes after trillion and what is, you know, whatever. I mean, we're talking about all kinds of money that we don't have, that you never have, to gather all the materials and somehow make a moon and get it to stay in place and orbit like it. Listen, we couldn't do it. But God did it without our help. And that's just a smaller light to God. And he did all of our solar system and all of the other solar systems. Who knows how many there are. And he originally intended that Pluto be a planet. And so, I don't know if he did or not. But, um, but here's the thing, guys. We have to understand that, that God wants us to give out of love for him but also as a family saying, hey, we're in agreement with this. We're in agreement together. Okay? And then he, he goes in a little deeper with this. And he says, agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out thence, till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. This is kind of a, a, a tricky kind of thing, but basically what we're looking at here is that, again, we're to have relationships that are right. And so he says, when you have an adversary, what do you want to do? You want, to, you want to agree with them. Now, it can get complicated because we can look at this and we can say, well, what kind of, uh, who's the adversary? Well, is it my, my best friend down the street that I've known for years and years and we're having a, 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 an argument and, and uh, he says, I did this and I say, I didn't do this? Well, you could certainly apply it here and say, I'm going to agree with him quickly before it gets farther before it goes to the court, before it goes somewhere else. I'm going to make sure this is right. You know, I like what it says in the Old Testament and the book of Psalms where it says that we need to be the kind of people that swear to our own hurt. You know what that is? That's like, okay, I'll do this. And then later on when we find out we can't do it or it's going to cost us, we still do it. You know, and I had to be reminded of this. I remember... Because, you know, you know how dads are, is that, you know, we always intend on, on doing good to our children. But sometimes we're just busy. And sometimes we are, like, tired or whatever. And so I got in the habit of, of saying to my children when they would ask me, Dad, can we do this? Can we go here? Can we go there? I, I would say, oh, I'll have to think about it. And I remember Andrew saying one day, why don't you just say no? Because we're not going to do it. When you say, I'll think about it, it doesn't mean you're thinking about anything. You're just going to go sit down. And I had to apologize. I had to make that right. You see, we have to be willing to make things right while we're in the way. But the adversary is also the enemy, isn't he? He is called the adversary, isn't he? Satan's called the adversary. And if he accuses us and we try to defend it and say, well, I'm not that bad. I'm not this. I'm not that. Agree. Agree quickly. You ever had those thoughts where you think, how can you be a Christian and you have these thoughts? Well, don't try to bury it. And say, well, I'll just think about it and it'll go away. Agree. Yeah, how can I be a Christian and have these kind of thoughts? But I can be a Christian because the blood of Christ has cleansed me from all of my unrighteousness. But you, you can't, don't try to defend, don't, don't, don't try to say, well, I'm not that bad. Of course you are. I, it's always amazing when people will give a testimony. And I'm glad they've kind of stopped some of that because they used to do this thing, all, you know, all the people, um, every guy when I was a teenager that would give a testimony, they had all been, you know, uh, hell's angels, or they have been, you know, uh, uh, axe murderers, or I don't know, they were just terrible stuff, they were. And we're thinking, we're sitting in church with you? Come on, man. Um, 
but it became a self-glorifying kind of thing. Can you top this? And, and so the, the other people who had never been, you know, they'd never been near a motorcycle. They didn't know what that was. They didn't know anything about anything. Um, they would just say, well, I don't have much to share. Well, of course you do, because God has kept you out of that foolish kind of lifestyle. But we need to understand that when Satan will say something to us or we'll be uh, we'll have this that this idea in our mind that we're not as bad as we are being brought to think of. Or like if a preacher is preaching a sermon and you begin to feel uncomfortable, you begin to feel convicted. Agree with the conviction. Don't say I'm not that bad and I'm never going to come back there again. Oh, yes, you are. If I had a dime for every person that said they'd never come back again, I'd have at least three dimes. But I want you to understand is that is that you and I must agree. When we begin to get that convicting and that accusing of sin, especially if it's true in our lives, agree with it. Agree. Because if you don't, it's not going to get better. It's going to become worse. This is where sometimes the Spirit of God can be an adversary to us when He is pointing out things in our lives. And so, in this case, Jesus is using a very familiar kind of thing by, by talking about going to court and saying you've been accused of something. So agree so that you don't have to go before the judge and have something worse happen to you. He said if you feel like you would get thrown into prison and you're not going to come out until the last of it has been paid. Now I never understood the whole concept of debtor's prisons because if you owed money, how are you going to pay the money? You know, you're in prison. But what they would do is they would just collect from your family. They would, they would put them in, in bondage until they paid it off. It was called, for lack of a better term, extortion. Okay, um, you know, And if you do not pay, then your, your mother is going to die or your, your wife is going to be on the street being poor and selling apples or whatever. I mean, just terrible things happening because you did not pay your debt. And so he's saying this is what will happen. Well, when you think about this in, this in the sense of being a child of God and God as our adversary, was it, I can't remember the name of the, the man that wrote, um, I think his name was Frank Thompson, I think, wrote this book called The Hound of Heaven. And it was, I don't know if you ever read that, it's a little allegorical kind of poem. It talks about how the hound chased me through through field and flood and all the how the hound and the hound was the spirit of God chasing me and chasing me and chasing me until finally he caught me. Well, now is the accepted time, isn't it? Behold, now is the day of salvation. Behold, now is the time to make things right, isn't it? If God is dealing with your heart, you should deal with it now. Don't say, I'll deal with it next week. Don't say, I, I'm going to go to this thing and I don't want to miss out. No, whatever he's dealing with, do it now. Make it right now. Because if you don't, it will get worse. Here's what I've discovered about God is that he loves you. He loves me. And he is intent and determined that we live the way he wants us to live. And so he will do whatever is necessary to bring us to the point where we have nowhere else to go but to him. Have you ever been there before? Oh, I have. And you have nowhere to go. And everybody's going to know about you. Everybody's going to know the secret you've been trying to keep. But if you don't make it right, it's only going to be worse. This is what Jesus is saying. You need to make it right because you're not going to come out until the last, the uttermost farthing is paid. You're not going to come out until it's done. Wow. Can you imagine Jesus coming and speaking to our church like this? I think I was telling Joe some time ago we were looking at this and you realize we modern day preachers in modern day meaning the last 2,000 years, um, and there's certainly nothing wrong with what we do, but I, I just want to make a point here, is that we spend a great amount of time 
and use a great amount of words to explain what Jesus just said. Isn't that amazing? This is the sermon he's preaching. But the way that these Jews would think, they were catching on to this. They, they, this is how they were taught. We uh, Gentiles, we, we have a whole different way. We have this Greek style of, you know, we get to talk and we get to, everyone, uh-huh, yes, yes. That's why you have to have a beard because you have to be able to do this. But it's important that when we are hearing the word of God, that we seek to see what he's saying. What is he saying? And not add to it, not try to change it, not try to detract from it, not try to say, well, he doesn't, that doesn't mean that today. I always hate that when somebody says, well, this doesn't mean this today. Well, what does it mean? And when did it stop meaning that? Was there a point in time when, ta-da, this doesn't mean this anymore? No. You know why we, people say that? Because they don't want to abide by it. And for sinful man, that's always the time they're living in. I don't want to abide by this. I don't want to do this. That's why sometimes um, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day and, and he was saying, how come it is that no matter how far a person has walked from God and you come to them and try to help them, they just, they just have a whole bunch of but what ifs. But what if that? But what if that? And I said to him, I said, here's what I have begun to do, and not always, but for the most part, I try to do this. When I find a person who is one of those but what ifs, I simply give them scripture and I walk away. I don't try to explain it. I don't try to give any more warnings. I just give the scripture and let God deal with them. And I find that he's a much better power that he deals with people much better than I can. Oh, we can explain, we can have conversations with people, but when we get this constantly, well, what about, well, this, uh, well, uh, I don't think that means that anymore, then just give the scripture and move on. Because that's the sword of the spirit. God will use that. And that's why I try always to give scripture all the time. Why? Because they don't need to hear what I think. I can tell them what this means, but I don't need to tell them, well, I think that it means, that I, no, just give it to them and say, this is what it is. Take it or leave it. If you want to talk more about it, call me. You see, we, we don't have to try to make friends with lost people or with, we don't need to make, be friendly so much with backsliding believers. Give them the truth. Don't pat them on the back and say, we'll try to, hopefully this will work out for you. No. Either you're going to follow Christ or you're not. What does it mean to follow Christ? We all know this. If any man will come after me, let him do what? Let him deny himself and take up the cross. That means you're no longer the star of your own show. Let him deny himself and take up his own cross and what? Then follow me. I used to, as I think, as I would hear this as a younger uh, man, and I would think, I, I would kind of get this picture of, of, of the Lord leading us. I don't know what he looked like, but here he's leading a, a vast, a vast army of people. And as he turns around, everybody has a cross. Because that's who he's leading. He's not leading people who are, you know, I'll be the assistant to the cross bearer. No, everybody has a cross. And it's a cross that says, I am what? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Listen, what a wonderful thing that is, that we're picking up the cross, we're carrying it, and we're part of this great multitude of people. I don't think there'll be crosses in heaven, though. There's no need for them. The Lamb of God is no longer being slain. What a tremendous thing this is. So, the righteousness of Christ versus the self-righteousness of man. Someone once said there are only two major religions in the world. There is Christianity and there is Hinduism. And the reason why Hinduism 
as opposed to all the other isms that are out there, is that Hinduism is this vast conglomerate of gods that have to be served and appeased by the hard work of the followers in order to gain any kind of benefit from them. Well, in the Christian life, it's what? Christ has done it all. Every religion that is a works-based religion comes out of Hinduism. It's the same, same philosophy. So Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Seventh-day Adventists, all these other people that sound so nice and look so good and, and, and even carry Bibles with them, but there is a works-based belief that says, if we do this, we will be saved. Matter of fact, it's kind of like what we might do when we're cleaning out the garage or we're cleaning out the, our drawer or something like that and we see a bunch of junk that, you know, for years we've had to have it in that drawer. We don't know why, but it, we had to have it because, by golly, we, we bought it and we put it in there at one point thinking that that would be the, just the right place for it, but we've never used it again. And so when I start to clean out a drawer, I get a big trash can and I just... <laughs> or I dump it in there. I don't care anymore what's in the drawer. It doesn't matter to me. Now, you know, my wife, I think at one time said, well, what if there's, what if there's a bunch of money in that drawer? I said, who are you married to? Listen, God looks at us and we come with all this junk of our righteousness. It's kind of like Abraham who said, what about Ishmael? And God says, I'll take care of Ishmael, but I didn't, I didn't want Ishmael. He's not the one. Isaac will be the one. I'm going to give you this son, but I don't need Ishmael. Wow. Nobody, people reading the Bible never seem to get that. That God threw Ishmael and his mother out. We ought to get it, though. There's a whole chapter in Galatians on it. God will not take our junk. He won't take the stuff that we think we want to keep and hang on to. Man, we ought to ask God, God, help me to throw this away because I don't have the strength to do it unless you help me. I feel like that sometimes. Because we don't want our works. We want His. Amen? All right, let's stop there. And um, we need some prayer requests.